It's a measure of social determinants of health. We infer based on where you live, what is your exposure to toxins in the environment, crime, what opportunities do you have for primary care, colonoscopy screening, and that kind of thing. I happen to have a supraventricular tachycardia, which means my heart rate sometimes goes from 50 to 170, uncomfortable, not life-threatening. Well, Mayo, whenever I get an EKG, runs 14 algorithms on that EKG, which are shown to the clinician describing my risk of atrial fibrillation. So they've built algorithms with, again, about 80% accuracy can say, oh, based on this cough, it is likely to be this infectious disease or maybe this structural problem or asthma, or maybe it's a cancer. So it's, again, not perfect, but it's a wonderful mechanism of starting to take a simple tool, your phone, and triage a symptom into what kind of care you might get next. That's a democratizable algorithm. I, you could bake it into the scanner. So even if there is not a subspecialist in that region, the scanner itself could say, ah, high risk for cancer, best to actually do something for this patient now. Right now, we have a profound supply and demand mismatch in health system. That's the key problem we are trying to solve with AI and digital health technologies. We see, according to WHO, there are about four and a half billion people around the world who do not have access to healthcare products and services. So there is a health equity challenge here. 
We see again, according to WHO, that there is a shortage of over 10 million healthcare workers around the world. We believe, uh, and most of the senior leaders around the world believe that digital technologies and AI can help us to a certain extent, can help us solve some of these problems. Of course, AI is not a panacea. It's not gonna solve everything, but it's going to improve the efficiency and it's going to solve for uh, some of the challenges on the outcome side. We will all have, in about 30% of our lives, we've got a primary caregiving responsibility, either a child, a partner who perhaps has a health issue or a disability, or an adult um, elderly parent. That's just part of the human condition. Thinking about, you know, staff that have to travel for work, what kind of flexibility do you offer? Everything from if you've got, you know, a staff who is breastfeeding, what kind of what kind of possibilities can you do to offer support for that to continue to happen? Can you provide an airfare that allows, you know, baby to go with or partner to go with? increasingly normal, men are doing more of the hands-on care work. Um, I think we've got to lean into spaces that make that normal for men. Um, so whether it's changing tables, you know, just even some of the design around us as a world, right? Do your workplace bathrooms have a space for, if you have male, female bathrooms, you know, do you have a space where there's a changing table in the male restroom? Do you see other men doing it? Are there enough of you that it doesn't feel like, well, that's a weird thing that I'm doing? So both seeing ourselves leave the office because we've got care duties and not feeling like we're being delinquent at the workplace. It's the small scale stuff, right? A corporation that says no more meetings after four because most of us need to go pick somebody up in that window. We can join perhaps a little bit later, but we'd prefer an earlier cycle. Try to get the work day to coincide with kind of what seems to be the school drop off and pickup cycle. I don't think there's a formula. It seems to be a lot of asking, iterating, repeating, testing, all the above. Your life gets better. The planet you live in gets better. Your workplace gets better. I want men to feel that and all to, to feel the benefit when it happens. And I want them to feel troubled when it doesn't. Mm -hmm.